Rescue 8, truck 6, truck 3, battalion 3 in the on-call inspector. 2303 West 46 Street, number 208. On this episode of Sioux Falls Fire, we're on scene at a structure fire at Elmwood Golf Course. We take a trip up north to Lyons, South Dakota, and we look at our new heavy rescue being built. And we take a few minutes to talk to a couple of our new cadets. This and so much more on Sioux Falls Fire. So today I'm with uh, Division Chief Mark Bukovich, and we're out here at Rosenbauer, South Dakota. And uh, we're looking at our new heavy rescue, which is being built. And, uh, just to get a little information from you, Mark, uh, what exactly are we looking at with this heavy rescue? So uh, what we're going to do is currently it's Sioux Falls Fire Rescue operates two USAR trailers. Uh, the full complement of building shoring materials, building breaching materials, um, anything that you need in a building collapse as well as high angle rescue, swift water rescue, all the various aspects of USAR. Um, we're going to eliminate one of those trailers and we need to carry it on a vehicle that's quicker out the door has all the equipment that we need and is readily staffed and utilized on every response in the city related to USAR, as well as capable of fighting structure fires and medical emergencies and everything else that we respond to. So what we needed, we needed a large vehicle that could fight fire as well as carry all this equipment and so therefore the concept of the heavy rescue engine came about. So this is a, a frontline apparatus yeah, for absolutely. us. It'll be utilized every day out the door yep. for it'll calls. cover uh, It'll cover a normal territory in the city just like every other fire engine or fire truck. Um, they'll go to every emergency in their territory that they're available for, and then they'll also be tasked with any USAR event in the city. Okay. And when you say USAR event, you're, what's that encompass? So it could be anything from a building collapse to a water rescue to a um, um, high angle rescue with ropes um, to trench rescue, somebody that's caught in a trench. Anything related to that, they would respond to and be the technical experts as well as have the equipment to handle the emergency. And you deal with uh, with the design and the build of the trucks on most all of our apparatus from start to finish. How, what, what kind of process do you go through with that? Correct. So we have a apparatus design committee that fluctuates from anywhere from six to ten people depending on the vehicle that we're designing. So in this case with the heavy rescue we had approximately ten people involved in the design because we brought in USAR people that were experts on the equipment that needed to be carried, how it needed to be uh, situated or located on the vehicle, as well as our other apparatus design experts that know pump capacities, tank capacities, and really how to start the vehicle design from beginning to, to, to end. And so in this case, we had about 10 people on the committee. They started the design process about two and a half years ago mm -hmm. and uh, worked with a local manufacturer, which is Rosenbauer, to um, pinpoint um, exactly what the needs were and how we could arrange the vehicle and design it so that it was in as small of a package as possible but still fit everything. And this committee, it's from firefighter on up. It's, Correct. It's yep. all, all different ranks are um, involved in this design. Yep, so you have oversight from the chief officer level but really the uh, nuts and the bolts of the committee as far as decisions actually happens from the captains, drivers, um, emergency vehicle technicians and firefighters. All right, well sounds good. Thank you Mark and uh, appreciate it. You bet. So I'm here with Scott Hubble. He's the production coordinator here at Rosenbauer. And uh, Scott, um, you know, we're looking at uh, our heavy rescue is currently in what stage of, of production right now? Um, right now we're basically, um, we're through the scrub process is what we do first. And then once that happens, um, we begin the build process. The chassis is here by then as usual, mm -hmm. or by that time. Um, once the build process begins, um, it goes through many different departments, approximately seven different departments. Okay. Um, and it takes uh, uh, eight to ten weeks. Okay. So we're in uh, electrical area right now? Right now, now we're that... in chassis electrical. So okay. the chassis is being wired for um, about everything the chassis needs to operate the body and, okay. and so on and so forth. And with all the lights, sirens, all the bells and whistles. Correct. And, and yep. All the like lights, that. the sirens, the okay. uh, yep, intercom systems, um, okay. EMS cabinets, things of that nature. Okay. And from here... Where, where does it go next after electrical? Um, it's going to go to body build. So the body will be sheared and bent uh, to a building, and it'll be assembled and then put on the chassis. Okay. So it's, like you said, an eight to nine week process. There's a lot of different things that are involved with it. Um, a lot of different people involved. About uh, uh, typically, are most trucks kind of a, just a, a, a streamlined thing, or is a lot of them one-offs? Depending on um, everything's here, pretty streamlined. Um, okay. They all have a designated spot to go right after each department. Yep. Um, it may take a little time to get into that department, depending on the process mm -hmm. that it's going to be operated in. 
And most everything's kind of a custom build, depending on what the department's looking for, or? Correct, we do okay. uh, mostly custom builds here, um, and every department is aware of that. We have a spec book that tells them what they need to do um, okay. at each department. Well, that sounds good. I appreciate your time here, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Now we're on scene here at a Structure Fire at Elmwood Golf Course, and I'm here with Captain Wade Mulder. He's a captain on Rescue 8 first arriving crew and uh, tell me a little bit well what you saw when you first arrived and uh, what all you started doing. All right um, well we we're just pretty close down the street here we pulled out of the station and and I could see that we had black smoke and I reported before we even got here that we had a, a working fire and uh, pulled up on scene uh, had a hydrant I knew we had a hydrant in the area and we found the hydrant right away and we pulled past and went and looked to see what was all on the other side. So we got to see three sides of the of the structure, yep. and uh, it was about the roof was probably a third involved already. So internally, it was fully involved. And in, um, in this building, we're on a golf course, and this is primarily their uh, golf cart storage, correct? Correct. Yeah. And uh, so, what kind of things did you have to think about with that in mind? Well, first thing I did is I seen a gentleman over here. And uh, as we were pulling the hydrant, I said, exactly what do we have in here? So I got a first-hand account that it was full of golf carts and yep. that, <clears throat> that there, was, there was no gas going to it, which was, I was happy to hear. Okay. And uh, so I, I was pretty relieved right away to find out what the contents were and that we didn't have other problems associated with us. So it was pretty straightforward right out of the gate. So a lot of the plastics and tires and different things like that, good, I mean, it was black smoke. That it was that the community was seeing, so yeah. uh, just a lot of, primarily a defensive. Yeah. And... Absolutely, yeah, we, we knew it was defensive when we pulled up. Okay. And uh, that was just, was just a matter of seeing if there was anything else that, that was threatened. All right. So yeah, we checked, checked to make sure our exposures were okay and, and uh, what was in it for materials. I was kind of concerned about what was in it, what the contents were. Yep. Obviously, I didn't want it to escalate farther, so okay. I was more important than anything is find out exactly what we had inside and we All had right. the perfect witness to talk to. So. Well, sounds good. Thank you very much, Wade. You're welcome. Have yes, a good one. Today we are here with John Wagner. He's part of the Fire Prevention Division. We're gonna take a look at the truck that he uses to do investigations, but before we take a look at the truck, let's talk a little bit about fire prevention. Uh, John, welcome to the show. Thank you. So I know we go out on fires, we investigate them. What else um, do we do in our division? Uh, we kind of have three facets in our division. We usually do public education, schools, uh, we do code enforcement, and we do um, fire scene investigation. Okay, so when we're talking about education with the schools, um, are we hitting all the grades? Or Kind of explain that to we us. We generally hit kindergarten through fifth grade so that uh, the kids kind of have a, a dose of fire safety um, training throughout their elementary school years so that they can kind of go on later on in life and, and be safe with the things they do at home. Okay, and then we talked about code enforcement um, in businesses. Uh, what are we doing when we go into those businesses? What are we looking for? What we're looking for is like fire safety hazards uh, such as exit doors being blocked or emergency lights not working, things that, that could cause a problem for people that are in the business to get out safely and for the employees in there to, to do their day-to-day -day job. Okay, so we're really educating them at the same time, showing them how to keep their business safe exactly. and everything. We're not just looking to go in there and, and write them up for something. It's more of an education piece that we use as well. Exactly, because the things that we do in those businesses help keep them operating uh, if they have a fire, it's disastrous to both them and the community, so we want to try and keep them safe and, and keep them open. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, now let's talk a little bit about the truck. Now the third facet is we go on investigations, and this is the truck that we take. So explain, Correct. when we do go to an investigation, what are we looking for? When we do an investigation after a fire has occurred, um, we, we do what's called an origin and cause. Uh, we want to find out where the fire started and what caused the fire to start. And with that investigation, we can determine, you know, was the fire set intentionally? or was it an accidental fire, and we can go from there. If it was set intentionally, then we get Sioux Falls Police involved, where they do the criminal part of it. If it's an accidental fire, then we try to find out, was it an issue where uh, an appliance or device malfunctioned because of manufacturing defects or issues, or was it used improperly uh, by the, the resident that caused the fire to happen? Okay, and then on average, how many fires are we investigating a year, would you say? Probably about 300 fires a year. Fires. And how many do we have on the division? We have uh, nine fire inspectors that do investigations. All right. Well, let's take a look at the truck here, John, and kind of go through some of the tools that we use when we're on the fire scene and how we investigate the fire. Sounds good. All right. 
Now, one of the things we do when we are on scene is we need to document the fire. And to do that, we have a series of different types of cameras, correct? Correct. Um, so let's just kind of go through the cameras that we have on the truck. Uh, we'll start with this guy here. Okay. The first camera is it's a digital um, camera that we use to document the majority of our fire scenes. It's important to document the scene because unless you have proof of what happened or what you saw, it's, it's hard to prove that in court. So we generally take pictures of the outside of the, the structure and work our way inside to the area where the fire started at. Uh, we call it basically the area of least damage to the area of most damage to help us determine the origin and cause. So that's our main tool that we usually use when we do investigate fires. Okay, so this is the one you're going to take in and take most of your pictures with. That is correct. And, and document. All right, so next we got this guy here. That is a rigid sea snake uh, that helps us to look in, in places that we can't get to, such as behind walls, uh, under small areas that we don't have access to. So that kind of basically uh, can go through a hole in the wall and we can look at electrical wires or electrical switches and things like that to uh, get a better idea where things are located and what has happened. All right. And then finally we got this guy here. What we have here is a small waterproof um, digital camera. We use that for areas where it's either storming or, or wet outside or inside sometimes there's still water dripping from ceilings and that can actually ruin a digital camera, a normal one. This one is waterproof and what's nice about this is it has a feature that uses Bluetooth that we can take that camera and extend the wand on the camera okay. to look up above attic areas or down below vehicles, whatever else, and we can project that picture to a cell phone so that we can control it as we look. So that's a very handy uh, tool there for us because we can't always crawl under vehicles and, and look for a uh, source of a fire or up in attics or areas like that. So it's a, a very, very useful tool for us. All right. So besides the cameras, we do have some other tools here in the back. We'll take a look at some of those now. All right. All right, let's pull this out. All right, so I see here we got our SCBAs. And uh, what else we got here, John? It looks like we got some uh, scene lights here. We've got a couple of tripod mounted scene lights. Uh, makes it easier because if you think about it, when you're investigating a fire scene, there's no electricity, so there's no lights. So you're doing everything by flashlight or by portable light. So we use those to light up the scene to help us do our investigation uh, much easier. We've got some ladders on here because sometimes we have to go up and look up inside areas we can't reach to normally, so the ladders help us with that. Uh, we also carry hand portable flashlights. Um, we have lots of flashlights. Without the flashlights, we can't do our job. Um, and then usually on the other side over here, we have some tools that we use, uh, which are just shovels, picks, rakes, um, things like that to help us pull the debris apart to get a better look at what's underneath it. Okay. Um, because again, there's always usually things like not, or like nails, sharp objects, glass. So we don't usually go in with our hands. We use tools such as the shovels here and the hand trowels and all these different devices to do the work for us um, so we can get to the seat of the fire. And I noticed with some of these shovels, you know, when we're, when we're going through the big trucks, we see bigger tools and stuff. And I see here we got the smaller shovels because sometimes when we might be looking for, let's just say a cigarette butt in a, you know, 100 square foot room through all the ash. So we need to get down Exactly. We don't want to use a, a backhoe to, to take us apart the steam because we might be looking for one small item like a cigarette, but we're using the hand trowels. We're getting in there and moving these things out. It could be a long and tedious process, but that's what the whole thing is about, is trying to find the source of the fire. All right. Uh, anything else on here, John? That... Uh, we basically just have some small power tools such as drills or saws to help cut things apart. If we're looking for evidence, um, we usually take a, a a sawzall and cut a piece of wood or, or some carpet out so we can send it into the lab to get examined for flammable liquids. Uh, we have cleaning tools to help clean us up after the fire because we don't want to get in the truck uh, totally coated with, with dirt and everything else from the fire. So we have to kind of clean up our scene, clean up us, ourselves as, as well as we can because of the cancer issue with, with investigating fires. Well, John, I know you mentioned uh, we send stuff into the lab, such as carpet samples and everything like that. Do we have a lab here in town? Uh, we do not. Um, sometimes the police department handles the lab work, but sometimes we also use the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the ATF. They also have fire investigators that work on the federal level and assist us in fires from time to time. They have been gracious enough to let us use their lab on the East Coast to send samples to to check if they have any flammable liquids in those 
samples that may have been a, a cause of the fire if it was intentionally set. Okay. Now, you mentioned the ATF helps us out sometimes. Do we have an office here in town, or do we call them to, to travel in? Well, there is an office in Sioux Falls that has a, a certified fire investigator um, with the ATF, and they, they basically handle the entire state plus Sioux Falls. So when they're available um, and we can ask them for help, they come out and graciously offer it. Okay, awesome. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, John, is uh, when we get called out to a fire, I know the trucks and the engines, they're all going code three, which means they got the lights and sirens going. Do you guys get to do that as well? Or is it when you guys get there? Because I know we're not gonna really start our job till the guys got the fire out and everything's under control. Exactly, we don't get to go code three, which is fine because every time a, a truck or a police car, or whatever else drives code three, there's always a risk of injury from either the police officer hitting somebody or somebody hitting the police officer. So we just basically go our normal speed once we get dispatched to the fire because, again, the crews on scene are still fighting the fire, putting it out, things like that, so there's no rush for us to get there. Uh, once we get there, we start our investigation by interviewing witnesses and people that maybe have been in the house, et cetera, to get a picture of what might have happened. Okay. Well, John, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, showing us the truck You're and ex thank kind you. of explaining what fire prevention does on a daily basis. So thank you. I'm here with firefighter Mark Olson, and we just dug out, did a demonstration of a dig out on a fire hydrant covered in snow. Uh, Mark, as you know, seconds mean a lot in fighting fire and when you come up on scene. Explain to us a little bit what, what goes through your mind when you have a fire hydrant that's covered. When we have a fire hydrant that's covered, it's going to take a lot more time to get water to the fire truck, and water is the most important thing we have as far as putting out the fire most times, so it can be a safety hazard for us. Um, we also make sure, want to make sure we save as much property as we can, get that fire out fast. Yep. So, you know, what's, what's the biggest thing for the homeowners to realize? Uh, just take a few extra minutes to s shovel it out, right? Absolutely. You know, not only is it uh, tough to get at the hydrant, but sometimes it's even hard for us to see. Sometimes these fiberglass markers break off and we don't know there's a hydrant there. And we want to be able to come on the block and see it right away. They can just take a few seconds to shovel it out so we can see it when we drive by and then connect to it easily when we get here. So anything a homeowner or a business order or even a neighbor, you know, it doesn't have to be the, the person who lives right there. If, if a neighbor notices that their uh, hydrant in their neighborhood's blocked, go ahead, scoop it out. Do something to help each other out, correct? Absolutely. If somebody sees one that's buried in snow and wants to take the time to dig it out, that's a huge help to us. Yeah, in this demonstration, I know it took you guys just right at a minute for it, and that extra minute can save lives. For sure, absolutely. Every minute counts for us, every second counts. And the faster we can get to people and get water on the fire, the faster we can save your property or possibly save your life. So one, one question that a lot of homeowners will have is, how much space around the hydrant would you like scooped? Uh, we'd like three feet. Our hoses don't just bend at sharp angles, so we want to make sure we can get that hose straight. Three feet is the ideal space around the hydrant we'd like to have. Three feet all the way around. Correct. All right, well, sounds good. Thank you very much, Mark. So I'm out at the training center today with our nine new cadets. Uh, they just started. We're in the second week, and I'm with Cadet Truckenmiller. And, Miller. and uh, you just got to try on an SCBA for the first time. Uh, how was that for you? It was interesting. Interesting. It was very interesting. Expand a little bit on that. Um, I have done it before in the volunteer ranks, but it's you know a different feeling being part of this group. You know, yep. it's a very, it's kind of a, it's, I don't know how to say it precisely, but it's a whole different feeling, even though it's something I've done a dozen times before. Yep. And just so the, the so you know what an SCBA is, it's a self-contained breathing apparatus. It's the uh, the pack that we wear when we go into a fire. And it's, it's the air that we get to breathe to, 
to keep from breathing in the toxic smoke and different things. So within this first couple of weeks, how's it going for you? Uh, very good. Very humbling. Humbling? Okay. Yep. Uh, um, learning a lot of new things? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's starting off to a good start for you. Yes, sir. Good. That's good to hear. You said you were f with a volunteer department beforehand. Uh, which department was that? I'm an active member in Brandon Volunteer Fire Department. Also, oh, just outside of Sioux Falls, Brandon, yep. in a small town. Um, what? Uh, how long have you been with them? Eight and a half years. Eight and a half years. So you got a little little bit of experience coming in. Yeah, I do, but it's a different ball game. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's every day. Yep, exactly. And um, as far as EMS, are you a medic or? I am a recent, um, this past year I became a paramedic in South Dakota, and it's a different ball game too in Sioux Falls. I worked as an EMT in Sioux Falls for about a year while I was going through school, mm -hmm. and I'm a little familiar with the streets, but it's a different animal every day. Yep, so all of it is something new, and but you have a little bit of experience, but we're also teaching you the, the Sioux Falls Fire Rescue way. Yes, sir. All right, well, thank you very much, Cadet. All right, I'm also with Cadet. Clausen here. He's uh, one of our new cadets, just started out here within the past couple weeks. You've got a little bit more history with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. Can you explain that a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, so when I was in high school here in Sioux Falls, I had the opportunity to join the Sioux Falls Fire Rescue Explorer program. Mm -hmm. um, that was a program for teenagers who were maybe sort of ex interested or learning more about the fire service. Um, and when I was part of that program, I got to do ride-alongs um, with active duty crews. Um, once we got certain or a certain distance through the program, doing the book work. And if I remember right, you were doing a ride along on with with my crew one day, and you got injured, so I had to do some yep. paperwork. That is correct, Chief. <laughs> but uh, so, and you you also um, you're coming from a different department within the city, correct? Correct. I worked in planning and development services for the last three and a half years, uh, working specifically in the zoning division. Okay, so this has been something you've been working for, testing for, wanting to get with Sioux Falls Fire Record. Yes. Rescue. Yeah. So this is my fourth time testing. With okay. Sioux Falls. Um, I enjoyed where I worked before. It was a great experience for me, but I'm happy that I stuck with it and that it worked out and that I got to start here last week. All right, one, one little question from, uh, from your work within planning. What kind of skills do you think you can bring from that into the firefighter? I think the main skill that I can bring to the fire department is talking with citizens and meeting with citizens every day. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of what the actual information or what the situation is, uh, in my previous position, I talked to citizens in person every day, on the phone, via email, and that's the same sort of customer service approach that we have here at Fire Rescue, even though it's more of a different situation with emergencies and things like that. Well, it's a great thing. Like I said, you've got a little bit of history with us. It's, it's been fun to watch you coming up to this point so far. I'll be interested to watch you keep going through the Cadet Academy here and once you hit the floor, and go on. Thanks, but, Chief. Got thanks. a lot of work to do and have everything to earn still, so All we're right. going to do as a team. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for watching this episode of Sioux Falls Fire. And like I mentioned on the last episode, and like we talked to John earlier, if you do have any questions about smoke alarms or if you'd like us to stop by, take a look at your smoke alarms, give us a call down at Fire Prevention at 367-8093, and we'll be happy to stop by. And if you do have any questions regarding the show, log on to our website at siouxfalls.org fire and drop us an email. <laughs>